everyone. Thanks so much. Yeah, the make it pop, eh? Mm. Um, all right. So I want to share with you um, one of my most beautiful memories that I have. And that memory is with my grandfather. My grandfather was a professional trombone player. He used to play in the National Symphony um, for over 30 years. When I was a kid, I was obsessed, still am today, uh, about music and how emotions lent themselves to music really, really beautifully. When I was a kid, I used to beg him to play for me. And he would, of course he would. He would concede, he would sit down and play for me an audience of one. Uh, and, you know, he would sit down, take a couple of breaths, and play anything. He could play Bach, Beethoven, jazz, the Pink Panther theme song. Didn't really matter. He used to play it. But always, without fault, at the end, he put his instrument down, took a couple of breaths again, and he would always ask me if I felt the sound waves rushing through my chest. And I realized, yeah, I did. I felt, I don't know what I felt, but, but in those, you know, two minutes where he would play for me, I would feel sadness, I would feel delight, surprise, joy, all in, in, in a matter of seconds. And it turns out that when all of us have had these experiences, all of us have had these beautiful memories. When we have a beautiful memory like this, regardless of, of it being special like that with my grandfather or being very mundane, whenever we feel, it's as if the brain blinks. There's a study that came out of the University of Tokyo in which participants were asked to go on daily behaviors and daily things such as reading sentences out loud, reading a manga, watching an animated movie, solving a puzzle, calculating mathematical functions. Now, I don't know how everyday that is, but we'll let that one slide. And touching a physical doll. The results were actually quite startling because what they realized was that, well, all of us right now, we, we're, we are producing at least two waves, two brain waves, alpha and beta waves. If you're a little bit hungover, you're Alpha and beta waves are a little bit lower, but that's okay. You're still alive. Now, what I'm showing you here, these are theta waves. Theta waves, before this point, had only been linked to dreamlike states, aspirational experiences. We had only seen, seen theta waves whenever we were dreaming. We were dreaming of flying or we had a horrific nightmare. Theta wave production would skyrocket. However, these people were wide awake and they were doing things, everyday things. So it's as if they were dreaming while being awake. The brain recognized subtle cues, little things, and became inspired by it, and theta wave production skyrocketed. An increased amount of theta waves also resulted in an increased amount of learned material. Participants learned things a lot better. The, the, the animated movie, they learned about it, they learned about, um, you know, whatever it is that they were reading or, or the puzzle they were solving, they, they, it, naturally they were learning a lot better. An increased amount of theta waves also resulted in an increased amount of catecholamines. It's an enzyme that is produced in our brains. This enzyme helps us, it promotes vital learning and memory. When we're kids, 12 and under, our brains are flooded by this enzyme. And as we become older, this enzyme is harder to produce and harder to produce, which is why when we get to our age, it's harder for us to remember things and it's harder for us to learn something. That's, that's why people say that you know, uh, children have uh, a sponge-like brain. It's because of this enzyme. Now, they were producing this enzyme, these, these participants. And when asked, hey, why is it that you remember some things better than others? For example, the person that did the mathematical function, they did not remember it that well, no surprise there. Um, but when asked, they answered that it was an adoration for the details. They fell in love with the small things, the small things like touching a doll or the, or the, or, or the beauty in the manga that they were reading. Two of the most quintessential designers of our time, Charles and Ray Eames, famously known for, for the uh, Herman Miller chair, which I'll share with you in one second. They're often quoted with saying that the details are not the details because the details are what make the design possible. This is a piece of furniture that are most known for, the Eames lounge chair, made by Herman Miller. You can still buy it today. It sits at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. 
So it's, it's definitely a piece of furniture. Hopefully you get a chance to sit in. It's absolutely beautiful. Now, take a look at it. Every single curve lends itself to purpose. There is intent behind this piece of work, this piece of art. Do you see the inclination? Charles and Ray Eames went through countless iterations to find the right angle at which the spine could decompress, but the chest could still remain uptight, meaning that you could still read while being relaxed. And the magic number was 15 degrees. If you buy one today, you will receive an Eames lounge chair with a 15 permanent degree reclination, not 13, not 16, but 15. So with all that, let's switch gears and talk about the web. We're not here for furniture design, we're here about digital experiences. I'm gonna share with you the very first web page ever created. It was this. It looks terrible, of course, but it's with a purpose, right? The web was not meant for the emotional experiences that we impart on it every day, not at all. The web was meant for academia. It was meant for the storage and dissemination of information. That's what it was meant for. So this sort of makes sense. Nowadays, of course, we don't have this type of websites. We have beautiful things. The same could be said of mobile, in a way. This was the very first mobile device ever created. The Motorola Dynatac 8000 by Martin Cooper, that man right there. Now, this was first sold in 1983. It held a whopping half hour battery. And uh, of course, you could only do one thing on it, which was call someone. It sold for $4,000, which today, if you had bought this today, would be $10,000. I don't know how much that is in euros, but think about it for a second and make it into your own currency. But $10,000, that's, that's insane. That's crazy. Now, there was one purpose to this device, and the device was to communicate. That's it. It was to send auditory signals from one side of the room to another, or hopefully one city to another, because this was a very expensive piece of equipment, so hopefully the people that were buying it were using it well. Later on, remember this. Everyone remember, I remember this so well. Later on, what, as phones became smaller, batteries became more powerful, reception became stronger, cell phone manufacturers like Nokia decided to do something a little bit more, entertain. And, all of it, and this changed the game because all of a sudden, what people were expecting from their phones was not just to communicate, but it was to communicate and also be entertained as well. So you can consider this to be the very first app ever created the snake game. And when you saw the photo, you saw the snake game, it probably brought you back. You, you, you probably had a, a flashback in an instant about yourself. I was like, I don't know, I think I was like 11, 10, 10, 11 years old when I was playing this game. It brings me back immediately. That's the power of emotion. Also though, that's the power of memory, is being able to transport yourself back to a moment and, you know, get, get goosebumps, get chills down your spine. Problem, though, is that us human beings, we are terrible with memory. Our recall is absolutely terrible. Right now, you're conscious of the last few words we've spoken. What if I asked you to look, think back to the photo that I shared with you of my grandfather? How many rows of musicians were there? How many different types of instruments were there? What was my grandfather playing? I mean, I said it out loud, so hopefully you remember that. Was it black and white or a color photo? Some details are easy. Some others are hard to remember. Even though we saw it, the brain recognized it, but it, it'll just discard it away. Like RAM memory, just discards it. It's no longer necessary. So how can we improve memory then? Uh, us, the apps that we design, that we create, that we build, that we market, that we manage every single day. How can we improve memory? The ask is actually quite simple. We simply just have to charge them with emotions. As soon as you charge any single event with emotion, the brain moves it from a short-term memory onto long-term memory storage, like a, like a computer, from RAM into its hard drive. And depending on how, how intense that emotion is, it's how long you'll remember it for. That's why I remember my grandfather and, you know, I was five years old, six years old, and I still remember it to this day. Donald Norman, who was a, a pioneer in UX thinking, Donald Norman said 
uh, coined the term of the emotional interface. He took it, he borrowed it from child psychology and child development. As kids, as babies actually, we cry. Of course, if any of you are parents, your child cries, and what do you do? You come to it, you come to the child and you offer warmth. You offer safety, you offer food. Baby cry and parent offers something. And that relationship builds, actually releases calming neurotransmitters throughout the baby's body, creating a relationship between trust and pleasure, one that is almost unbroken. That's why we are so close to our parents or guardians, because we have, we've had that, that chemical imbalance in, 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 our, in our bodies that has resulted in trust and pleasure. Donald Norman said that the exact same thing can be said with that of a machine, an app, a, a computer or a device or a website or an app. If an app is emotion, it has enough emotion and it is invested enough in the user, it can foresee all of user needs, can foresee all of the... Um, all of the setbacks and can produce an emotional experience, then there's no reason why we shouldn't build a, a, a bond full of trust and pleasure with a human being and a machine, an application. It couldn't be more true for us. The apps that we design, that we build every day, we have to fight constantly against real life. People are using their phones in the context of their world and we need to fight against that. We need to fight for their attention. We need to fight for their love and for their affection. We need to fight for these emotions. The way that we do it is we can do very simple, very subtle things. We can do micro-interactions. Now, micro-interactions are designed at the atomic level. Over the past 15 years or so, we've been tasked with answering really tough questions. What if we just turned that around? Instead of asking what is the hardest thing I can do, what is the smallest thing it can affect that will have the most meaningful change? So atoms, like microinteractions, are small, but they add up. They add up and eventually they become a whole or part of a whole, and this whole is momentous. I'm going to share with you one of the very first microinteractions ever in the history of mankind. And it's the written word. It's a poem. So let's read it. To fling my arms wide in the face of the sun. Dance, whirl, whirl, till the quick day is done. Rest at pale evening, a tall, slim tree, night coming tenderly, black like me. It's a beautiful poem. Did you notice my poem voice? <clears throat> poem voice. It's dropped a couple of pages there. But it's a beautiful poem. I don't want you to remember the poem, but I do want you to focus on the micro interactions embedded in this poem, the ellipses. Rest at pale evening, there was a pregnant pause after, and same with a tall, slim tree after that. We can keep going, and we can find that there is yet another microinteraction in the exclamation points. Now, James talked about this yesterday, how something can be flat, and flatness gives us nothing, right? Nothing. But with these cues, with the ellipses, with the exclamation marks, all of a sudden, we have waves, we have emotion. And what Langston Hughes, the creator of this poem, wanted you to do is to remember it by these emotions. Remember it with the dance, with the whirl, with that pause. Otherwise, we would have just read it, and it would have been words. Small things add up. Now, I'll share with you one of the very first microinteractions that I remember in our field, and let's see if you share my memory. Remember that? Mom, get off the phone! Oh, man. Now, this... <laughs> I know. It's like, it's like beautiful, but it's not, you know? Um, now, you can remember that. And uh, regardless of where you were we, were, we all we all share the same memory. We were trying to connect to the internet. That sound that you heard was was a mistake. It, engineers did not mean to, you know, output the sound of, of you know wires packets sending and receiving. No, but they did that, and and it stuck. And now that sound defines a generation. You either know it or you don't. That's it. And it defines people. If you were born, you know, past I don't know, 2004 and after. Well, actually, before that, 2001 and after, you probably don't remember the sound and don't care for it, but we probably we do care for it quite well. It probably was the beginning of our careers, beginning of our life as we know it. Now, I'm going to share with you 
five microinteraction principles that you can use. My hope is that you, you hold on to at least one of them and use it in the apps that you're building and designing today. So we're gonna start with Visual Polish. Visual Polish is carefully crafted, beautiful user interface. This is the attention and detail that you know, really good apps are, are known for. The problem with Visual Polish is that, and what I often hear from developers, they, they, t they tell me, well, like, I I'm not a designer, I, I, I can't design beautiful things. Of course you can. Every single human being is a designer. We all solve problems every day. This, though, was a designer. The reason why I love showing this is a site called lotsofdonuts.ca. I'm Canadian, and in Canada we have a, 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 sto a store, a coffee and donut store called Tim Hortons. What this designer decided to do was to create a site just showcasing all the donuts, like the honey cruller. Now take a look. I mean, there, the design here is not Amazing. It's not like crazy complex. What she decided to do is change the background color, obviously, you know, spending a good amount of time on the aerial view of the donut and the slice view of the donut. There's not a lot that takes high visual amounts of polish, and I absolutely love this website. It's a beautiful, delightful experience, especially if you're Canadian. What about Partly Sunny? Partly Sunny is, is an app developed by a developer, created by a developer. It's a weather app. Take a look at its visual hierarchy, its composition, big numbers where it matters, small where it doesn't matter as much. It's a gorgeous app, and yet it doesn't take much to design something that is high in visual polish. Most people think that you, know, you need to design a game, you need to have all these shadows and these beautiful characters to have that degree of polish. No, it's not needed. When I was working at 500 Pixels, which is a photo sharing community, we were redesigning the photo page, and the photo page had shortcuts with it. If you take a look at the F, underneath the F, there's a little line, and that corresponds to the finger bump that we have on all of our keyboards. That little line that guides your, your, your fingers, is supposed to guide your fingers, but you know, everyone's like, obviously looking at their keyboard all the time. But that's what that finger bump is, is used for at least. Now, this is such a small detail. Was this a deal breaker? Could we ship without this? Of course, we could. We could ship without that little line. But we fought for it. We designers fought for it. We, we, we coded it in the end. It was not a big deal. And if two out of every 10, 20% of people saw this, saw this line, that probably meant that they thought to themselves, wow, I mean, you know, if 500 pixels is so, so detailed and careful with attention to detail here, then they must do something great with my photos. So yes, I'm gonna trust 500 pixels. That was our hope with that line, with that small line. Take a look at uh, Swarm. Swarm is an app that allows you to check in and uh, check into places all around the world. I use it sort of as a travel log. It's a really beautiful uh, app. It used to be Foursquare, now it's Swarm and Foursquare. And take a look at the, 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 the stickers on the right-hand side. Really, really nice attention to detail, beautiful design. But what about the header at the top? There's a nice, beautiful squiggle. Or the avatars. The avatars, they're not circular, they're not hexagons, they're circled hexagons. Unique shapes. Even the back arrow is custom. Now, let's switch to personality. And personality is, is weird. I mean, we have all had this strange connection with something that is completely unreal. We fall in love with Disney characters, for example, or we fall in love with, with, with a, a teddy bear that someone gave us. We, we name the teddy bear, we name it and we sleep with it. We love it. We love attaching ourselves to other people and other things as, and create relationships. We thrive off of those relationships. It's, it's biological, it's, it's ingrained in us. We can use that in the products that we build. I used to work at Mozilla, I used to work for Firefox, and if you open up Firefox, I mean, the logo has a fox in it. So we use the fox quite prevalently to, um, to, to enhance the experience. This screen that I'm showing is when we were debuting uh, Firefox OS, an operating system. Now an operating system is actually pretty bland and boring, but with the fox, the fox immediately gave it some sense of, of purpose, some value, and the fox could then breathe the values that Mozilla stood for, like openness, transparency, net neutrality, and protection, and the same thing can be said of Firefox. 
MailChimp is probably, Freddie from MailChimp, is probably the, the, the most popular uh, personality in our space. MailChimp is an email campaign software, and um, you know, uh, Mail Freddie's all over the place. I have actually a Freddie figurine. MailChimp just sent it to me out of nowhere. It's very, very popular. It's actually so popular that it's, Freddie has mooned 208 million times. In 2016, <laughs> Freddie mooned people on the login page a whopping 2008 million times. What about Abe from TimeHop? TimeHop is an app that allows you to review one year ago, three years ago, five years ago, review your social media as far back as you became socially active. And it's an adorable little dinosaur. And it's so, it's obviously, it it's, has a purpose, right? It's a dinosaur. You're taking a look back in time. Let's open up the app. And we're going to take a look at how, did you see it? Oh, for some reason, it's not playing. Well, we'll see, we'll see uh, Abe again. So let's not, oh, there it is. Look at that. It's so adorable. With a rocket ship backpack <laughs> flying off. I mean, that's the reason why people use Time Hop. Humor and microcopy, if personality, per and I admit, personality is hard. It's a hard thing to get right. If you're a developer, this is where you can start. This is, some of the funniest people I know are developers. So you can start with humor and microcopy. Now, the, the great thing about microcopy is it allows you to bridge the gap between a machine, an app, and a human being. It won't, we won't get, you know, we won't completely erase the gap, but we can bridge it a little bit. And if we do, and if we use it wisely, microcopy can be used to foresee moments of conflict and step away, allow the person to, you know, regroup a little bit. Hearthstone is an app that is created by Blizzard, available on mobile phones. As you're going through the tutorial, you will die. You have to. And this is what you see. Blame the terrible game designers. And, you know, it's, it's frustrating going through a tutorial and, and dying. So they put this up to, you know, let you come off the ledge a little bit. And be like, oh, okay, it's a tutorial. It's okay. Let's, let's keep going. Uh, this is United Pixel Workers. Back when they were still up and going, I wanted to buy a t-shirt, a San Francisco t-shirt. I decided against it because shipping was extremely high to, to Canada. Um, but I still got an email. It says, complete your United Pixel Workers order or don't, whatever. Hi, Ricardo. Shopify informs us is that you started to check out and never finished. Maybe that's because you saw how much shipping was going to be and freaked out which was true. Maybe it's because you, your browser crashed. Maybe you had to sh save a child from a burning building. Whatever the reason, we'd like your money. Like, we'd like us to give you your money, to give us your money. By the way, here's what you had in your car when you left, which was the San Francisco t-shirt. And I did, I bought it. I bought it because this thing made me laugh hysterically. They used SaaS to wheel me, wheel me back into the product and eventually purchase. SleepBot, which is a, a device that you put underneath your pillow, it gives you SaaS as well. If you don't use it, it's, it's, have you really not slept in seven days? What, what's wrong with you? And they do this as an, as an, as, once again as a trigger to allow you to re-engage back with the product. So microcopy is, is extremely important. MailChimp, once again, if you enter the wrong username, you get this. A username that already exists. Maybe it's your evil twin, <laughs> Spooky. And, you know, it, it, it is, right? I mean, it's, it's very frustrating, at least for me, to know that R. Vasquez or Ricardo or I am Ricardo Vasquez is taken or Ricardo Vasquez or Vasquez Ricardo. You're trying all these usernames and it's every single time is more and more and more frustrating. And this is how MailChimp tries to get away with it and tries to, you know, calm you down a little bit, bring some humanity back into a Another, another a very, very digital experience. Now, we've talked about digital experiences so far, but you can still do microcopy in physical products. What about this? Stop looking at my bottom. It's a Tetra Pak by Innocent Pure for Smoothies. If you look at the underside of it, you'll, you'll see this. This is the reason why I buy Innocent Pure for Smoothies, because I think that's hilarious. These five words um, made, it cost me to buy 
innocent smoothies over anything else available because it made me laugh. It gave me, it gave me that emotional connection that we are all seeking every single point in our lives. Carbon Made is a visual, uh, it's a portfolio site. It's mainly geared towards designers so that you can visually build a portfolio. And they have a subscription model tier here. We have uh, OK on the left-hand side. We have Woo, which is probably the best one, and Laser Whale on the right-hand side, all caps. That's amazing. It's amazing to see that, you know, Carbon Made is willing to, to edge over and, and use microcopy in a subscription page. Usually you don't do that. If you talk to any marketer, they will kill you for wanting to modify anything in this because even the slightest percentage can mean hundreds of thousands of dollars in lost revenue. They don't care. And by the way, go and look at them. They're definitely a role model for personality, for visual polish, for microcopy. Uh, it's full of it. Carbon Made it definitely has some great energy to it. We're going to talk about Abe again <laughs> with microcopy. <laughs> Abe farting in our face. Um, yeah, it's there. And, and every single time that you open up a time hop and you go through this time hop, this experience, looking back at your life, um, Abe always says something snarky like this or something positive as well, like, hey, you, you are, you know, street number 10, etc. Transitions. This is what John was talking about yesterday. Think about the flick of a light switch. When we turn it on, something happens, the light Let's go on, the room gets brighter. When you turn it off, the opposite things happen. The same thing can be said of that of a digital experience, an app, obviously. You know, when you tap on a button, something should happen. When you drag, something else should happen. And these are the, the things that are harder to think about, harder to implement. Some people, you know, some developers might be like, it's impossible, it just means it's too hard. Designers can be like, oh no, sorry, I don't have time for that. That's because prototyping takes so long to get this right. Turntable FM was a freemium service in which you could, you could you know, put as much money as you wanted, subscribe to as much money. Take a look at the, the one for $25 a month. That monkey is in love with you because you're giving free, uh, Turntable $25 a month. So they used a purposeful transition to help you or help, help the system uh, get more money out of their subscribers. Now, we all know this one. We all know Facebook reactions. The, the purpose of transition is not really here, but rather in this right here, in how a person will move with different, uh, different symbols and will try to identify with one of them. And as it gets bigger, then you can identify. You can sort of put yourself in a sad state, be like, mm -mm, no, sorry, I don't feel that. Angry, mm -mm, I don't feel that. Um, happy, oh yeah, I feel that, and then let go. It's actually a very, very clever interaction. By heightening the emotion, the face and the animation, you get to feel a little bit of what that feels like and you get to match your feelings against these. Dribble is, uh, is an app that just came out, actually. Take a look at that. I'm putting this shot, this dribble image, into a bucket or a list called illustrations. And as soon as I tap on it, very nice animation, and then that once again goes into the bucket of illustrations. Really, really beautiful animations. And the great thing about this is that it becomes addictive. You want to keep doing it over and over and over again. So it's a very smart play to do, especially with the actions that you want people to perform, like Snapchat. Snapchat wants to reload as much as possible, so you can see, keep seeing more stories and more stories and more stories. Snapchat doesn't just have a personality in the ghost it's winking at you, but there's also purposeful transitions in the way that the colors of the rainbow appear as it's loading. It's really beautiful. And people want to do it over and over again. They want to see that winking ghost. They want that, you know, the ricochet effect of the ghost just going off into oblivion. There is intent behind this, believe it or not. Things three was just released. And this is one of my favorite micro-interactions right now. It's a beautiful, uh, it's a, Things is a to-do app, it, for those of you who don't know. And there's a plus here. If I, if I tap and I drag on it, it allows me to organize exactly where I want my to-do to be. Then I put, you know, add CocoaPods to my app because I hear it's really, really uh, helpful. And I press done and everything goes back into normal focus. It's a beautiful, beautiful experience. Probably one of the best interactions that I've seen lately. Now, it's all in the details. This is our last one. 
the principle of surprise. This is what microtractions are best known for. We call them Easter eggs usually. You know, oh, did you see the Easter egg here? It's the element of surprise. Human beings, believe it or not, I mean, you might not like a surprise birthday party, but you do like finding surprises hidden in digital experiences. It allows you to feel like you're an explorer, like you're, like you're discovering something for the very first time. That's what it is. Intelligently hidden little surprises. They add delight. They add that sense of emotion that people are seeking. If you open up the console in Mozilla, you get dino shooting flames in ASCII art. Really cool. If you go on Google Maps and you go to Area 51, Area 51 is in Las Vegas. It's said that you know, it houses alien remains and such. If you take Pegman and hover it over Area 51, it becomes a UFO, <laughs> just adorable. It becomes a UFO, and Google Maps is, is riddled with all these little things, all of them. And what you want to do is you want to keep finding them. You want to keep exploring. Let's say that we're walking from Amsterdam to Amstelveen. It takes about an hour and a half. But if we're walking from Amsterdam to Utrecht, it takes us eight hours, and look at the icon. It now becomes a walking person with a walking stick and a backpack, because it's a hike, eight hours. That's a long time. So it's, everything has intent. What about this? Twitter. Look at that heart animation. Look at that beautiful heart animation. Talk about something that is addictive. And the purpose of Twitter is to allow you to engage, right? To, to, to like, to reply, to retweet, to quote a tweet now. So this animation, this interaction is a genius one because it brings the emotion, you love looking at it, so you wanna keep doing it over and over again. And what about that bow party, huh? Um, once again, looking at Swarm, if you keep scrolling past the reload, you're gonna find a little bee with Swarm. Now, you know, th that's cool, that's cute, not a lot there. How about if we scroll down past the stickers, Swarm is a very old app, so they have a lot of stickers, and some of them are old and you can't really see them anymore, unless you keep scrolling and keep scrolling till you find the attic. You open up the attic, and guess what? There they are, under a film of dust. And you can, you can move the dust away. Talk about you know, an Easter egg that, I, I mean, if I, was, if I was designing this, I'd be like, I don't know if that's possible. If I were coding this, I'd be like, mm, that's impossible. I, I don't know how to do that. Uh, right? Uh, but it is possible. And once again, what, 20% of people, 10% of people probably do this and saw this? Doesn't matter. Be the reason I saw it and I became even more engaged with the product. I knew that this product now has history and I'm part of that history. These are all my, my stickers and my badges that I earned when the app had just released in 2008. WWDC. Take a look at this. It's a constant of jacket size equals medium with a comment of made in the USA. This jacket was given to all WWDC attendees um, when Swift became open sourced. Momentous moment, the Apple had never open sourced anything in their lives, so Swift, uh, until Swift, and instead of using a normal tag, why? Why do that? Use a Swift constant, use the thing that you are most proud of, and you can also, Share that emotion, share that memory with participants, with the developers and designers that were there at that conference. Basecamp is also really good. This is the sign up page for Basecamp. If you keep focusing on different fields, you'll get the person will be following you, which is really cool. And if you get something wrong, oh, uh -oh <laughs> that's not right. We shouldn't be doing that. Sign up is such a hard thing to do. And if there is someone, this personality here, if there's someone helping you through it, then you'll be more likely to do it. Someone is helping you through. There is that trust and relationship. The emotional interface is really strong in this, in this specific flow. So I get asked this question, how can we mind contract and where do we start? I love talking about my contractions. I love talking about the details, the small things that really matter. And my, my answer is this, is you always start at zero. And I mean that in two ways. For product managers out there or developers out there, make sure that 
when you are thinking of a feature, you, you, know, you carve in some time and you allow time to explore micro interactions, to explore surprise or microcopy or visual polish. You allow for that time. What I really mean by always starting at zero is to do this, to take a moment right now, hopefully, and bring yourself back to your first happy memory. What was it? Does it, give you, does it give you goosebumps thinking about it? Does it give you chills down your spine? Does that memory define you? This memory defines me. It defines me not just to honor a man who taught me the balance between passion and discipline, but also because every feeling that he gave me, I want to give back as a designer in the apps that I build every day, all that emotion, the, the feelings that I couldn't put into words. I want to do it in some way. It's a tall task because music, as we know, is a very emotional journey. But I, I'm, still on that, I'm still on the journey regardless. This is Donald Norman, and this is one of his quotes. He says, it is not enough that we build products that function, that are understandable and usable. Great. But we also need to build products that bring joy, excitement, pleasure, fun, and yes, even beauty to people's lives. So this is what I ask of you today, is to find your memory. That's all. Find that one thing. Find the one thing that, 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 that gives you so much energy that you want to start creating all the apps in the world. And you want to start talking to all the people in the world, sharing this memory. Find it and then never let it go. Thank you. Cool. Thanks so much. We do have time for questions. I thought it'd be going way over, but it was actually pretty okay. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. If not, just think about a memory that you have. But yes, there is one here. Hello. Hi. Um, I think it's very important indeed to design with emotions to keep the users engaged, but emotions are very tied to uh, culture, family, uh, community. Uh, so how do you know, how can you figure out and what are the risks by designing certain micro interactions, micro you know, emotions, engagements that might be funny to maybe some group of people but you know, borderline offensive maybe to others or not offensive but have the opposite effect? Totally. Uh, this is a really. How good do you deal with that? I mean, it's it's a, such a wide range. I don't think it's it's you can't even count it. I think. Uh, it's a very very good point. I used to when I used to work in Mozilla, we I was creating an app, and this app I was called WebMaker. This app was going to be marketed to India, Indonesia, and Brazil. It was an app that allowed you to make projects, sort of instead of like consume the web like we do with Facebook, create the web. So this was the app that we created with at Mozilla. And uh, I began with, with a very, very elegant app, sort of like a dark room feeling to it. It was black and purple. And uh, it was, it was, it honestly, it looked really good. The visual polish in it was really high. Then uh, I was almost done. I was in my final iteration, really, well, about my final iteration, probably like three quarters of the way through. And the, uh, the user researcher that was on our team uh, pinged me on IRC, which is what we used in Mozilla, and said, hey, like, it, are these the final colors of the app? I'm like, yeah, it looks sick, doesn't it? Black and purple, beautiful. She's like, no, 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 black and purple are, are colors, like, they're colors, they're really seen as colors of death in, in India and Indonesia. We can't use them. And that's the first time that I came across this, this, this barrier. In North America, at least, look, at I'm wearing black. In North America, black is seen as elegant. Black is seen as, you know, something that has poise. But in India, black is seen as the complete opposite. The best, um, the best resource I have for, you know, fighting through that is to prototype these microinteractions and to test it with as many people as possible. That is really, is research, is data that wins. Uh, there have been times where uh, I wanted to put a Nyan cat, you know, the Nyan cat, Nyan cat. Um, I want to put a Nyan cat. <laughs> Uh, on, on, one of, uh, on one of the apps that I was building. And I realized after I showed it to like, everyone that, were not, that was not in tech, and they're like, sorry, what is it? Uh, I then I realized that I'm speaking f to myself. I'm not speaking to the people that I'm designing for, so I had to change that. And, uh, and I actually ended up going with nothing. Sometimes, you know, no mind contractions is better than a, 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 a bad one. It lands like a bad joke. 
So I completely agree. Research is the key. Hey, thanks for a great talk. I have a question. Like, as a designer, you, I'm completely buying this idea for delightful things. But how do you sell this idea to product owners and other stakeholders? How do you appeal to them? Yeah, it's, it's like the, the number one most uh, popular question that I get is how will developers and product owners, you know, be convinced in it. What I bring usually to the conversations that I have with product managers and developers as well is uh, is data surrounding the it's data surrounding emotion. Really, I show other apps that have done it, and I'm like, hey, take a look at this, and I let them walk through it. And they'll smile, like guaranteed, they'll at least chuckle. I'm like, hey, like, look, you just did this. Imagine if we did this to the three million people that we have in, uh, in uh, that we have uh, that have downloaded our app. Imagine if we did that. So I, I do. I, I tend to do a very aspirational sort of conversation with them. At the end of the day, you know, there was one CEO that I used to work with, and the CEO said, "Well, how will this give us more users? How will this little thing give us more users?" At the end of the day, I can't answer that. We can't. We can't. But we can hope. We can hope for the best. I said, we can, we can hope that this this little micro contraction will result in a memory. Can I test it? Yeah, I can test it with like sample size, but it's not really going to yield me good results. What we can do though is we can take what we know. We can take what we know in, in psychology. We can take what we know of ourselves as human beings, and that we thrive off of these little things and these relationships, and we can apply it to a product. That's usually how I've won people over, by a showing them that anyone can 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 be delighted by an experience, but also by uh, you know by saying that there is it's not it's not a feature you know there, there's no flow to this right it, it, it's something that if the culture of your product allows it you know if, if you're working for a bank it might be harder to do um, neon cat there but. Um, <laughs> Imagine though, I would switch to that bank immediately, immediately. Um, but anyway, yeah. So it is a very aspirational conversation. It is. It is definitely. I think I'm out of time, everybody. But thank you so so much for being so attentive. Thank you.